It's nice to see you all. Uh, my name is Matt Ashley. I'm a professor in the theology department, and, uh, and I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I want to thank Leah and my other friends in the Alumni Association. Um, if any of you are here from the Eastern Kansas Club, you should leave now because you're going to hear basically a very similar lecture when I come in July. Um, and, uh, you know, I tweak it a little bit from time to time because uh, Pope Francis is often in the news. And, uh, <clears throat> but uh, I really love giving this lecture. I've given it, I think, 22 times in the last uh, two and a half years, everywhere from uh, Fort Myers to um, Rapid City, South Dakota. So, um, but I'm delighted to do it uh, at home because uh, the technology is a lot more friendly and I have somewhere here can fix things. I've been in lots of different venues and sometimes the technology is a little more tricky. But anyway, um, I'm really happy to see you here. And uh, I have about 40 minutes of remarks, uh, depending on how many stories I tell about Pope Francis because um, there's lots of interesting little trivia that I've come across. And then at the end, we'll have plenty of time for, for your own questions and observations about, um, about this pope. So let me go ahead and get started. Um, what I'd like to do with you today is to uh, share a few thoughts on Pope Francis's vision for the church and how it's been shaped in particular by his own experience as an Argentinian, as a Jesuit, a bishop, and now pope, and finally, uh, the spiritual roots that nourish his vision. I'm going to start with a brief reflection on that vision itself, and then uh, talk a little bit about his life, um, walk you through his life and the different ways that it has impacted his approach to, um, to being a leader in the church. And then, uh, perhaps a bit audaciously, because I'm not his spiritual director, talk a little bit <laughs> about his, um, his spirituality. And then, as I said, we'll have plenty of time for question and answers. So let me get my watch. There we go. So let me start then um, about the vision itself. And he's been very clear about this vision from the beginning of his papacy and even before. And to understand that, I want to look at a short speech that he gave at the conclave to elect the successor to Benedict the 16th in 2013. Before the cardinals are locked away to elect the pope and a veil of silence descends, there are a series of meetings in which the cardinals discuss what they think the church needs and what the next pope can and should do to, uh, to meet those needs. These meetings, they're called general congregations, are often dominated by eulogies for the recently deceased pope and making arrangements for his funeral. But in this case, as you all know, there were no eulogies to give and no funeral to arrange. Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI had withdrawn to Castel Gandolfo to the south of Rome to pray, leaving the cardinals to their work of electing his successor. The result was unusual candor on the part of the cardinals and in their conversations at the general congregations. In particular, there was pointed criticism of the managerial style of the top officials in the Vatican Curia, right, the, the organization that runs the church from Rome. Um, and in particular, the supervision of the Institute for Works of Religion, which is the official name of the Vatican's bank, which was on the verge of being kicked out of the European banking system because of all the shady deals that had been going on through it. There was also agreement that the officials of the Curia were too involved micromanaging details of local dioceses making bishops little more than branch managers of a home office in Rome that often didn't understand the problems that they faced uh, in a broad and diverse global Catholic church. And finally, many cardinals voiced a desire for a different approach to the church's engagement with the modern world than the one that had often ended up being a sort of a culture wars approach during the pontificates of St. Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict XVI, often getting in the way of the very new evangelization that these two popes um, so strongly desired to put in place. In the midst of all these opening statements, each cardinal, so they're all lined up there, and each of them is uh, allowed to give a speech from three to five minutes. I mean, 
as a former department chair who went to many meetings, it sort of sounds like the meeting from you know where, right? Because, and particularly the, the cardinals who were too old to vote anymore went on at somewhat greater length trying to uh, make their views known. But in the midst of all of this, the cardinal uh, Jorge Bergoglio from Buenos Aires got up and said the following. He said, the only purpose of the church is to go out to tell the world the good news about Jesus Christ. It needs to surge forth to the peripheries, the margins, not just geographically, but to the existential peripheries where people grapple with sin, pain, injustice, ignorance, indifference to religion, and misery. Instead, the church has gotten too wrapped up in itself. It is too navel-gazing. It has become self-referential, which has made it sick. It suffers from a kind of a theological narcissism. The next pope should be someone who helps the church surge forth to the peripheries, like a sweet and comforting mother who offers the joy of Jesus to the world, bringing changes and reform for the salvation of souls. After hearing this, Cardinal Christoph Schoenborn, who was a former student of Benedict XVI, the Archbishop of Vienna, and the general editor of the Catechism of the Catholic Church turned to a neighbor and said, that's what we need. Cardinal Bergoglio was on his way to becoming Pope Francis. This then, in a nutshell, is his vision for the church, to be on the margins at the periphery. He has made this clear from the beginning, particularly in the papal trips that he makes. He often goes to peripheries that one might not think of particularly places where people are suffering, particularly refugees. As here at Lampedusa, which is halfway between Sicily and, uh, and North Africa, where refugees' bodies wash up daily. Or to Ciudad Juarez on the other side of El Paso. Even when he goes to centers of power, as he did two and a half years ago in the United States, he takes time to go to peripheral places even there, homeless shelters, jails, and so on. But even though he is interested in the peripheries, that doesn't mean that he ignores the center of the church. Unlike his two predecessors, who tended to appoint powerful people they trusted to leadership positions in the Vatican central offices of the Curia, and then let them run things as they saw fit, Francis has taken a more hands-on approach. And as you may know, a major reorganization of the Curia will be officially announced within a month. He wants to make the Curia more responsive to the needs of the church on the ground, as it were, which means officials in the Curia should see it as their task to aid bishops rather than to tell them how to do their jobs. He has moved aggressively as well to reshape Vatican finances after the scandals that had racked its banks. And finally, he appointed a group of nine cardinals from around the world to invite, advise him on matters in the church as a kind of a kitchen cabinet. Now, this is an interesting move that can tell us a lot. In prior papacies, access to the Pope was very much controlled by top Vatican officials. With this group, Francis has wanted to open up access to important church leaders outside the Curia in Rome. And if you look at the list, the original list, you'll see Francis's vision of a global church in action. They come from Central and South America. Um, so there we have Mariadaga, where is he? Tegucigalpa. We have Santiago, although he's, um, some of these guys are just retired. Uh, India, Africa. Um, also Boston, of course, in Europe, but it's a very much a global church, right? And he meets with them on a regular basis. Um, I mean, it would be something like if the president were to have, say, a group of governors, nine or 10, and would meet with them every couple of months and would be very careful to have governors from very small states and governors from larger states, um, maybe even a governor from Indiana. Right? Um, now, his point also is that these are all, if you will, sort of working bishops. These are all people 
who are deeply involved in the affairs of their particular archdioceses and can give Francis a view of what's going on in the pews, if you will, um, rather than having things filtered through reports that come up to him through the various Vatican officials. Um, now, Pope Francis's style as Pope is an important part of the way that he wants to take attention away from the center and get the church to go outside of itself to the peripheries. He does this by the places he visits, as you know, and he was the first pope to visit the Arabian Peninsula just a month or so ago. Um, he also does it by rejecting much of the pomp and circumstance that often surrounds the papacy. This is one of the most fascinating features of Francis's papacy. You know the stories. He introduced himself to the church as a pope by asking them to pray for him with his head bowed. He rode the bus back to the guest house along with the other cardinals rather than using the papal limousine. Um, can anyone pick him out? <laughs> <laughs> and as you know, when he got there, he paid his own bill with his credit card. Earlier, when he had flown from Buenos Aires to Rome, the Vatican had bought him a first-class ticket and he took it across the square and exchanged it for an economy ticket. Uh, I actually remember I gave a talk somewhere in California, and you know how you get upgrades sometimes? Well, I didn't turn in my first grade, first class upgrade. Um, but that's okay, I'm not Pope. Um, <laughs> when he was vesting to greet the people of Rome for the first time, he rejected the jewel encrusted pectoral cross in favor of the pewter colored one that he had used since 1992 when he was first ordained a bishop. And when he was shown the boxes of red shoes that Benedict XVI had worn, by the way, red shoes is a tradition that goes back very early um, when only the emperor, the empress, and the pope could wear red shoes. Um, so that was the reason why Benedict wore it. Um, but Francis looked down at his own beat up black shoes and he said, these are fine with me. I could go on. Ironically, Francis draws as much attention to himself by his simplicity, perhaps, than his two predecessors did with their own striking style. Also, as you know, Francis is the master of the symbolic gesture and of the turn of phrase. In a 2013 interview that he gave, he gave us another take on his vision for the church. He said, I see the church as a field hospital after battle. It is useless to ask a seriously wounded person if he has high cholesterol and about his blood sugars. You have to heal the wounds. Then you can talk about everything else. Heal the wounds. Heal the wounds. But he has also driven his press office crazy. I think they must be really afraid when, he, when he's flying around on his plane and he goes back to talk to the reporters because then he'll say things that send them into uh, damage control. So here's a little bit of a, of a list. Um, one of these got him in a lot of trouble when he, went to, um, when he went to Mexico, when he said that Argentina was undergoing a Mexicanization. So he had to do some backtracking on that when he visited Mexico. Um, one of my colleagues in the department said that um, if women are the strawberries on the cake, then men are the nuts. Um, <laughs> But anyway, he says these sorts of things. Um, I would baptize a Martian. Um, and um, as I said, his uh, staff then kind of goes into damage control modes. Um, and I think he does it on purpose, though. I think he does it to sort of undercut the kind of hyper solemnity with which some people, anyway, tend to hang on every syllable that comes out of the mouth of a pope. He was asked when he was in Mexico, um, oh, by the way, so I have to be careful, I can't tell too many jokes or go over it. So when he was in Mexico to sort of uh, cool things down a little bit, he, he told a joke about being an Argentinian. So if there are any Argentinians in the room, I have no, I do not want to offend you. This was a joke that he told. Here's the joke. Does anyone know how an Argentinian commits suicide? He climbs to the top of his ego and jumps off. <laughs> so that was his joke, it's not my joke. Anyway, in the, in the same interview, he, um, he was asked by the interviewer whether he, um, if he talked too much and too spontaneously. And he answered, I talk the way I talk, like a parish priest, because I like to talk that way. I've always spoken that way. Always. For some, it's a defect. I don't know. But I think the people understand me. <laughs> 
It's interesting, he identifies himself as a parish priest. As you know, he's one of his other famous lines is that the shepherd should smell like the sheep. Um, and even though he himself was actually never a parish priest, um, he was a Jesuit um, who had oversight over a parish from a distance, and then, of course, he was a bishop. But that certainly is how he identifies himself, as being close to the people and what they're going through. To further unpack how this pope is trying to lead the church to be a church on the margins, and maybe to give us a bit more of a sense of what he means by that, I suggest we see him as something like a palimpsest. A palimpsest is a canvas or a parchment on which two or three layers have been painted or written over the original one so that the original one shines through. Um, I would suggest to you that there are at least three layers in the palimpsest that makes up Pope Francis and his vision for the church. Pope Francis, the Argentinian, the man of the church, and a man of prayer. And I'd like to say a few things about each of them. First of all, Pope Francis the Argentinian. Pope Francis is the first non-European pope since the eighth century. Um, sometimes, anybody know where the last non-European pope came from? Nope. Syria. He was Gregory III of Syria, uh, 731 to 741. So certainly, um, he is the first pope from the Americas. And he's very proud of his Argentinian heritage. Actually, when he taught high school as a part of his uh, Jesuit training, he taught literature. And, um, and he got away from teaching just the great classics of Spanish literature to teaching classics of Argentinian literature. One of his favorite books is this one, the um, Martin Fierro which is a, a, a 19th century epic poem by a man named Jose Hernandez, who it's something like a cross between uh, Dances with Wolves, The Last of the Mohicans, and The Magnificent Seven. Um, <clears throat> but he's very proud of his heritage, and um, he, his parents, or his grandparents, actually came from Northwest Italy in the late 20s, just in time to enjoy the Great Depression in Argentina. And although the family um, had to work hard, they were not totally impoverished. Jorge Mario was born in Buenos Aires in 1936. And except for short stints in Chile, Spain, and Germany, he spent his whole life prior to being elected pope in Argentina, and most of that in Buenos Aires. It's worth keeping in mind, then, that he's the first pope to come um, from a major city, indeed, from what might call um, a mega city. To give you a sense of that, I did a little quick research. In 2010, the city had three million inhabitants, about, and the broader metropolitan area had 15.5. Just for comparison, the same census or year, uh, Los Angeles had 3.8 million and 13 million in the broader area. So he's from a mega city. Um, and that affects a lot of the way he approaches things. Um, as a matter of fact, you can even think about the fact that he's really used to being around people, right? So the um, people made a big deal about the fact that he didn't want to live in the papal apartments, uh, but he lives in the guest house, the Casa San Marta in the Vatican. And, um, and he said, well, he said, they're not that lavish, but he said, but they're empty, right? And it's another access issue, right? Um, because when he's in the guest house and he has dinner with people, he gets to interact with all different kinds of people, and that's part of that upbringing, I think, in a large city. When young Jorge was 10, Juan Perón came to power in Argentina with a dictatorship that would last for nine years. Perón is probably best known to us from his wife, Evita, who inspired a musical and a film um, that had Madonna in the uh, title role. <clears throat> Perón advocated a new industrialization in Argentina, but along with the nationalization of key, in, uh, key industries, policies that favored the labor unions and gave him the loyalty of the working uh, workers in Argentina. All of this presided over by the power of the military and the moral authority of the church. It's a very unique combination 
of politics, militarism, and Catholicism that makes Argentina different from other countries in Latin America. And it's really important to keep that in mind in thinking about how Pope Francis sort of thinks about politics and particularly the relationship between politics and, and religion, between the church. Held together only by the force of Perón's personality and political skills, Peronism tended to fragment into rightist and leftist factions, which began fighting one another soon after Perón was forced out of, by the military in 1955. And, and really, for the next 20 years or so, Argentinian politics was dominated on how people positioned themselves when it came to Peronism. The young Jorge Mario was fascinated with politics, and while he dallied with some communist literature when he was a teenager, he settled back into the loyal sort of right-wing Peronism that characterized his family, and that indeed characterized most Catholics in Argentina, um, because they were put off by the increasingly anti-Catholic rhetoric of the left-wing side, the so-called Montoneros. Perón returned to power briefly in 1973, but by that time, the movement he had spawned had fractured so seriously that he couldn't hold it together, um, with extremists on both sides forming death squads that rampaged through the neighborhoods of Buenos Aires, so that when a military junta overthrew the government in 1976, there was a general sense of relief on all sides until the disappearances started. For the next nine years of the so-called dirty wars, tens of thousands of Argentinians, we don't really know how many, were arrested, tortured, and so-called disappeared, often by being drugged and dropped from planes or helicopters into the estuary of the Rio de la Plata or into the Atlantic Ocean. The most powerful and prophetic voice against what was happening was unfortunately not from the official church, but from a group of women whose children had been taken, who called themselves the Madres de los Desaparecidos, the mothers of the disappeared, who demonstrated every day in the civic plaza. One of the major questions that has dogged Bergoglio since those terrible years was what he did, what he didn't do, whether he did enough, because at this point, he was the provincial or the leader of Argentina's Jesuits. And that brings us to the second layer of his personality, a man of the church. This is his papal emblem. The IHS is sort of typical of the Jesuits, and I'm going to come back to his motto, miserando atque eligendo. Jorge Mario grew up in a devout Catholic family. He was the oldest of five children uh, and was often cared for by his grandmother. Family is very important to him. When he was 17, he had a powerful experience in a confessional, actually on the Feast of St. Matthew, September 21st, of a call to the priesthood, which he followed four years later. Here's a quick overview of some dates after he entered the seminary, um, in which after a year he joined the Society of Jesus or the Jesuits. Um, he spent his time studying in Argentina and Chile, as I mentioned before, 64 to 67. He's basically teaching high school, largely teaching courses in literature, uh, Spanish and Argentinian literature. Um, so you might notice that he was observing the Second Vatican Council from afar. He's the first pope not to have actually been there at the council, either as a bishop, so that would be uh, John Paul II, John Paul I, let's not forget about him, um, Paul VI, or as an advisor, Benedict XVI, who was then as uh, Professor Ratzinger, an advisor to the German bishop. So Jorge Bergoglio watches the council with, in, with interest, but from the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, the young Jesuit's holiness and force of personality were noted from very early on. So you can see he was made novice master very quickly. Um, and even more astonishingly, he was named the leader of the province in 1973 um, at a very young age. In an interview in which he looked back on those years, he is rather critical about himself. He said, my style of government as a Jesuit at the beginning had many faults. Um, this in the background, by the way, is a picture of the Colegio Maximo, 
which is the largest Jesuit institution in Argentina. I mean, it's something like, um, to the Jesuits of Argentina, the Colegio Maximo is sort of like the way the Holy Cross people feel about Notre Dame. I mean, it was the flagship. Um, and he spent six years as provincial leading all the Jesuits, and then he spent another uh, six years as the superior or the leader of this institution. So he was extremely influential for two or three generations of Jesuits rising through the ranks. But as he said, my style of government had many faults. That was a difficult time for the Society of Jesus. An entire generation of Jesuits had disappeared um, because many of them had left the priesthood, as has happened in many orders in the late 60s. Because of this, I found myself provincial when I was still young. I was only 36. That was crazy. I had to deal with difficult situations. Listen to this. And I made decisions abruptly, and I made them by myself. I want you to remember that. My authoritarian and quick manner of making decisions led me to have serious problems and to be accused of being an ultra-conservative. I lived a time of great interior crisis when I was in Cordoba. We'll come back to that. But look, I've never been a kind of a goody two-shoes, but I've never been a right-winger either. It was my authoritarian way of making decisions that created problems. Now, in fairness to him, the 36-year-old Jesuit took up the leadership of the province in 1973 when political divisions and violence in Argentina, which I spoke about a minute ago, were coming together in a sort of a perfect storm with deep divisions in the Latin American Catholic Church, including among the Jesuits. It was not just the Vatican II that was shaking things up, but the dramatic course change that the Latin American bishops had made when they met at Medellin a little over 50 years ago and broke the church's traditional alliance with the government and the military by committing itself to liberating the poor from death-dealing poverty. So-called liberation theology was only one aspect of a massive course change on the part of the church in Latin America, and it was met by violent repression. Perhaps most well-known to us in North America was the murder of Archbishop, now Saint, Oscar Romero in 1979. But this is only one, and the first bishop to be killed was in Argentina, Enrique Angelelli, whom Bergoglio himself knew, um, and who's now blessed Monsignor Angelelli, who was run off a road in his car in 1976 and beaten to death. Acts like this in Argentina were meant to send a brutal message to the church's leader there. Now, the Jesuits in Argentina were deeply divided over how to deal with this situation. And these divisions were so deep and were so impassioned that the provincial before Bergoglio was removed after only four years of a traditional six-year term, and Bergoglio was put in his place. And Bergoglio moved decisively. He was remembered as being a powerful personality, but also, as he himself admitted in the interview I just quoted, as an authoritarian leader. He rejected liberation theology, having its books removed from the Jesuit seminary, and he butted heads frequently with Jesuits in an economic and political think tank across town who wanted a more forceful analysis and criticism of the policies of the Argentinian government. Bergoglio thought that they were typical ivory tower academics who talk and write a lot about the poor but never actually spend any time with them, they thought he was a throwback to an earlier age in which the church towed the line set by the military and the government, gave out a little palliative charity to the poor, and therefore propped up a corrupt system. Bergoglio also opposed experiments in which priests were living in the slums, the so-called bias miserias, like this one, in the well, not just on the fringes, but within the city itself of Buenos Aires although he did advocate direct contact with and charitable aid of the poor. Because of all of this, he was perceived to be out of step with the rest of the Jesuits in Latin America. Now, during the Dirty War, when it became more and more clear that the military was engaged in wholesale kidnapping, torture, and murder of its populace, Bergoglio found himself in a bind. 
like almost all of Argentina's bishops, unlike bishops in Chile and Brazil or Romero in El Salvador, he chose not to speak out publicly, although he did work tirelessly, often at great personal risk, to gain freedom from some of those who had been taken by the military, as well as to help others who were on a death list to flee the country. One case in particular came up several times, um, the accusation that he had abandoned two of his Jesuit priests who were living and working in one of the Villas Miserias, Orlando Iorio and Francisco Yalex, who were then arrested and tortured by the military. On balance, the evidence exonerates him of blame, but it seems to me clear that this period still weighs on him as he himself confesses, I made many mistakes. After nine years in various leadership positions, the Jesuits didn't really know what to do with him. In Argentina, you either loved Bergoglio or you hated him. And it was difficult for the next provincial to govern in the shadow of this powerful personality who'd had such a huge influence on two generations, at least, of Jesuits moving through formation. Um, so what do you do with someone if you want to get them out of the way? Well, you could send them to get a doctorate, right? Um, and that's what they did. They sent him off to Germany to get a doctorate, um, and he worked on an important German Catholic theologian named Romano Guardini. But he was depressed and homesick while he was there, and so he soon returned, and the same divisions emerged again. Finally, not knowing what else to do, his superior sent him into virtual internal exile in 1990 to the city of Cordoba, which is about 600 miles northwest of Buenos Aires. He was not given a formal assignment there, even to preach and celebrate mass in the beautiful colonial era church. He was told not to call or to write his former students among the Jesuits. His job was to finish his dissertation, and beyond that, he could hear confessions in the Jesuit church, which he did faithfully every day. Many biographers talk about these two years in Cordoba as a kind of a dark night for him. He was deeply despondent and withdrawn. And one can imagine him reflecting back on the almost decade or more of church leadership, thinking about what he could have done differently and wondering why the labors he had embraced so tirelessly were rejected by so many of his brother Jesuits. Over a decade later, when he was Archbishop of Buenos Aires, he gave some advice to a politician who had been defeated in an election and was struggling to deal with that defeat. Live your exile, he advised. I lived mine, and afterwards you will be back. And when you come back, you will be more merciful, kinder, and you will want to serve your people better. Bergoglio did indeed come back, but not as a leader of the Jesuits, but rather as first an auxiliary bishop in Buenos Aires starting in 1992, and then its archbishop in 1998, and then John Paul II made him a cardinal in 2001. He did indeed want to serve his people better, but something had changed. As a former student, a Jesuit priest named Rafael Velasco reported, Bergoglio was so very conservative that I was rather shocked years later when he started talking so much about the poor, Velasco reported. It wasn't something that seemed at the top of his agenda at the time, but it became so as a bishop. Something changed. The archbishop declined to live in the official residence, a palace in a leafy suburb out on the suburbs of the city, preferring a couple of modest rooms in the chancery, the diocesan headquarters downtown. While he was provincial, or the leader of the Jesuits, he had a car and a driver, and now he drove himself or used public transit. Still, um, he's not wearing white in this picture. Um, <clears throat> and the uh, public transit in Buenos Aires is maybe a little bit better than it is in New York City, but it's still uh, a dicey thing when you get on a subway there, whether you're going to make it to your destination or not. Um, most startlingly, he sent priests back to live in the, slum, the slums, the Vias Miserias. Indeed, within the first year of becoming archbishop, he quadrupled the number of priests serving there, and he supported them both vocally and even physically with his own presence. 
A good example of this is the story of Father Jose Maria de Paula, Father Pepe as they called him. Father Pepe lived in one of these Villas Miserias, and along with a number of other priests, he started a campaign against a drug named Paco, which is a highly addictive and toxic leftover from processing cocaine um, to send the good stuff off to the United States and to Europe. <clears throat> these priests set up an Hogar de Cristo for the rehabilitation of addicts, and they also established mentoring relationships to keep the young kids from starting to begin with. They were very successful, too successful for some. One evening when Father Pepe was biking home, he was stopped by a well-dressed stranger and told that if they did not stop, quote, you're finished, they're sharpening your knives for you. When he called his Archbishop, Bergoglio replied, if someone has to die, it should be me. And for the next several weeks, he walked the streets of the margins in this uh, Via Miseria, meeting people drinking mate, which is his favorite uh, beverage, while denouncing the drug traders vocally from the pulpit, calling them mercadores de las tinieblas, merchants of darkness. He offered to stay in Father Pepe's home, and he also put him in charge of all the priests working in the slums. The message was clear, if you touch him, you touch me. Later, in what has become a well-known gesture from the Pope, he washed the feet of young people on Good Thursday, people who had been wasted by AIDS and by their addiction to Paco. Something had changed. Finally, in contrast to the years of the Dirty War, he confronted the government openly and forcefully, particularly on the rampant corruption, which was evident, for example, in a terrible nightclub fire in 2004, which claimed some 175 young people, mostly teenagers, tweens, because the emergency exits had been chained shut to keep people from sneaking in, and bribes had been paid to the appropriate authorities. The crash of the Argentinian economy in 2001 gave him an appreciation for the kind of economic analysis that he had criticized in the 1970s. And he, brought, <clears throat> and he began to talk about a global economy as an economy of death. Something changed. Now, it's certainly true that there are a lot of external circumstances that changed that led young Jorge Mario to change some of these views. Certainly, the experience of the dirty wars, ex exile in Cordoba, renewed hopes in Argentina that had been crushed by the economic collapse. Um, a growing awareness of how much the international financial system kept the poor there trapped and unable to find a more humane life contributed much. But to get to the deep, deepest roots, I want to turn to the final level of the palimpsest, Pope Francis, a man of prayer. Every morning, Pope Francis rises at 4.30 a.m. to pray for an hour and a half. Um, I was really intimidated by that until um, I read an interview where he said, well, you know, sometimes I fall asleep. <laughs> but he said, what a beautiful thing to fall asleep in the presence of the Lord in the Eucharist in the chapel. Um, so that made me feel a little better, although I don't get up at 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> he is a man of prayer. And I'd like to think about that a little bit. Two clues to his spirituality can be found once again, I think, by going back to those moments when he was elected pope. When he had reached the necessary two-thirds vote in, uh, to be in the conclave, his good friend, Cardinal Claudio Umez, who was the Archbishop Emeritus of that point at Sao Paulo, leaned over to him and gave him a hug and said, don't forget the poor. The Pope later recalled, these words came to me, the poor, the poor, and then right away I thought of Francis of Assisi, then I thought of all the wars as the votes were being counted till the end. Francis is also the man of peace. That is the name that came into my heart, Francis of Assisi. This is the first clue. The second came, comes from the response that he gave. So when all the votes are counted, the, the um, assistant cardinal archdeacon comes up and says, do you accept your canonical election as supreme pontiff? <clears throat> And the traditional response is quite short, accepto, I accept. Um, Bergoglio responded instead, I am a sinner, but I trust in the infinite mercy and patience of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
and I accept in a spirit of penance. So remember the poor, be a man of peace and of joy, trust in the mercy and patience of Christ. I want to unpack this a little bit by starting with that last point, particularly the issue of mercy. Do you know we finished about two years ago a year of mercy that Pope Francis declared, and it's probably one of the central turns in his own spiritual and theological uh, lexicon. For Francis, the encounter with God's mercy in Christ is the most important thing that can happen to a Christian. This is reflected in the motto that he chose when he was made bishop in 1992, Miserando atque eligendo. This motto comes from a homily by a medieval monk named the Venerable Bede on the call of Matthew. You might remember that Francis himself experienced his call to the priesthood in a confessional on the feast of St. Matthew when he was 17 years old. Here is the gospel scene portrayed by the great Renaissance artist Caravaggio. And this is, by the way, one of Francis's favorite paintings. Uh, they had a special showing of it for him. Um, and you can see Jesus standing over here pointing. And I love Matthew. He's kind of like, who, me? <laughs> um, and the whole painting is, it's worth thinking. It, it's organized around how people are reacting to Jesus' look. So, you know, we have, this guy just wants to look at the table and ignore it. This one is clearly fascinated. This one's shocked. And there's Matthew with this sort of who, me kind of look. In the story, as you know, he looks at Matthew and calls him, and in his little homily, Bede, his Latin translates something like, Jesus looking at him, having mercy and choosing. The point being that these are two sides of the same coin. The having mercy and the choosing are together. And whatever this was, it was powerful enough to get Matthew to get up, leave everything, and follow Jesus. Now, when Pope Francis uses this, um, he likes to use gerunds to translate the verbs. And it sounds just as awkward in Spanish as it does in English. Something like mercying and choosing, mercifying. Um, and I think the point is that for Francis, mercy is something that transforms a person. It's not just something uh, that fills you with relief that you're off the hook. To get a little deeper on this, I'll use a retreat that Cardinal Bergoglio gave in 2006 to the bishops of Spain. He gave a little talk on what he likes to call the first confession of Peter in Luke's gospel. You all know the story. Jesus is teaching on the beach. It gets really crowded. He asks Peter to let him get in the boat and get a little bit offshore. And then at the end, he tells Peter and his companions to put their nets over for a catch of fish. And you, you can just see them all rolling their eyes. Doesn't this guy know? We've been working all night and we haven't caught anything. But they do. And their nets are so full that they're kind of freaked out. They're amazed. They're astonished. Even a little afraid. And Peter says, um, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. And here is Francis' explanation of Jesus' answer. He says, conversion and mission are intimately linked in the heart of Simon Peter. The Lord accepts his go away from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man, but he reorients it with, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. So notice he doesn't tell Peter, no, that's okay, you're not really a sinner. And interestingly, he doesn't even say, I forgive you. He chooses him. So this is Bede's homily, right? From that moment on, Simon Peter can never separate these two dimensions. His sins do not prevent him from accomplishing his mission. His mission doesn't enable him to hide his sin. Now, if you think about this for a minute, um, mercy can be understood as a sort of an act of condescension on the part of the one showing mercy. I mean, you know, so I think here I am, I'm teaching a class, a student comes to me, says, oh, professor, my hard drive crashed. And it was a football weekend. I know exactly what happened the weekend before. And I said, oh, that's OK, Johnny. Just get me your paper whenever. So, so there's an act of mercy. But it doesn't really call the person to anything. It's just an act of confession I, or condescension. I'm the powerful professor. You're the student who has to come and grovel. And my act of mercy doesn't change any of that. And this is very different, though. The action of mercy that Francis describes 
is not just the forgiveness of a debt that the debtor cannot repay, but an invitation to come along and participate in what God is doing. It gives person dignity, a work to do. And what is the work? It's the work of enabling other people to experience that by reaching out in mercy to them. Mercy is the engine of evangelization for Francis. It's the fountain of creative action, even in a world as divided as our, and as a church that is also divided. Why? First, because a person who has been mercified or mercied is not afraid of his or her own weakness, limitation, even sinfulness. People are chosen precisely within their limitations and sinfulness. We're not lifted out of the world and turned into some kind of a superhero in either the Marvel or the DC universe. It's our own weakness that Jesus mercifies by choosing. So do not be afraid means don't be afraid of your failures and only partial successes. Take chances. Get out there. Give it your best shot. I think this explains Francis' own fearlessness and his own willingness to take risks. This is understanding of being mercified and chosen is what leads Francis to say in the joy of the gospel, I prefer a church that is bruised, hurting, and dirty because it has been out in the streets than a church that is unhealthy from being kept confined. More than the fear of going astray, my hope is that we will be moved by the fear of remaining shut up within structures that give us a false sense of security within rules that make us harsh judges, within habits that make us feel safe, while at our door people are starving, and Jesus does not tire of saying, you give them something to eat. I think this quote tells you a lot about how Pope Francis wants to lead the church. And I think he experienced this himself, particularly in those years in Cordoba. And it set something free in him, so that when he became bishop and archbishop and finally pope, he exercised a freedom and a creativity to approach challenges in a much different way than he did in the 70s. But this is also for him a source of peace and joy. Don't be afraid. Joy is probably the second most common word after mercy. He has the wonderful line in Evangelii Gaudium, an evangelizer must never look like someone who has come back from a funeral. And he shows this. He's always smiling. This amazes even those who knew him when he was archbishop because there he had a kind of a somberness about him that led some to nickname him uh, Monsignor Horseface. His friend of 40 years, an Argentinian human rights advocate, Alicia Oliveira, said of him, he's having a great time. Every time I speak to him, I say, be careful, Jorge, because the Borgias are still alive and well there in the Vatican. He laughs and he says he knows. But he's just very happy. He's having fun with all the people in the Vatican telling him that he can't do things and then doing them. Finally, he's a man of hope and what he calls of combative hope. That's the major message that he gave to the bishops of Spain. And mercy is the source of both the joy and the hope. The Christian experience of mercy is not something that we passively receive, but neither is hope. Hope gives energy and determination. And it comes from being changed by the experience of the mercy of God. <clears throat> In other words, this experience of mercy is for him the epitome of the gospel as he expressed it, this was the opening words of the bull of indiction, the bull declaring the year of mercy. Jesus Christ is the face of the Father's mercy. So let me sum up with a few points and then take your questions. Pope Francis's vision is grounded, I think, from beginning to end in this faith in Jesus Christ, who is the face of the Father's mercy. From his life and ministry in Argentina, he desires the church to be a church of the poor and for the poor, going forth to the margins and healing the wounds of the world. As a bishop with over 20 years of experience in Argentina, he learned that not every answer to every question can come from Rome. 
and that answers to the most difficult problems only emerge slowly after dialogue and prayer and discernment. Remember his, the way he criticized his earlier form. He said, I made decisions too quickly and I made them on my own. Um, this irritates conservatives and liberals alike and it may hamper his work in dealing with the sex abuse crisis where as I've been around the country, some people want him to move more decisively and more quickly. Well, he had experience of doing that in the 70s and he's wary of it. Um, that's just the approach that he comes out of. At the heart of his experience, as I said, is this desire that the church experience mercy and the freedom and the joy that it brings. And it's more important for him that the members of the church make that mercy present to others than it gets them to believe in the correct doctrines. <clears throat> Francis makes this clear with a favorite quote of his from Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI. This is from uh, Benedict's uh, Deus Caritas S, God is love. Francis says, I never tire of repeating these words. Being a Christian is not the result of an ethical choice or lofty ideals, but the encounter with an event, a person, which gives life a new horizon and a decisive direction. I think it's Pope Francis' own encounter with a Christ who mercifies and chooses that has given his life a new horizon and direction, and that he understands his role as Pope to be most fundamentally making that a possibility for all people. Thank you. So I'd be more than happy at this point um, if you have questions or, or further observations to, um, to take those. And I think there's, there's a microphone around because they are taping this and we want to hear your question as well as whatever I have to say. So, Leo, there's someone right back here and then we'll take you, sir. Thank you. I, I must, your presentation is excellent. Uh, my question is, what ever led John Paul II to make him a cardinal? Because they seem so opposite in their approaches, but obviously there's, there's some sure. answer to uh -huh. that. And, and, and let me say, I met John Paul II and shook hands with him with 5,000 of Jimmy Carter's <laughs> best friends in the back of the White House. Well, that's nice, you have a privilege I never had. Um, okay, so did everybody hear that? I mean, how did uh, um, um, Bergoglio come to be named, well, first an auxiliary bishop. Well, it all had to do with the guy who was the, um, the then Cardinal Archbishop of Buenos Aires, a guy named Antonio Quartacino. Quartacino really liked Bergoglio um, because the other thing is that it's not unheard of, but it's unusual for a Jesuit to be named a bishop. Again, it's not unheard of. Um, and Quartacino really liked, um, really liked uh, then Father Bergoglio for a couple of reasons. First of all, Bergoglio had shown himself to be hard on liberation theology in the 1970s, so that gave him some good marks. But what he really liked was that Bergoglio gave a number of retreats to the priests of the archdiocese. And Quaresino became really convinced that this was a really holy guy. Um, and, but he also knew that um, he kind of did an end run about, around the Vatican bureaucracy too. Um, because, uh, and because none of the head sort of honchos in Argentina thought Bergoglio was worth making bishop. So when, when, um, when Quaresino went for his yearly visit with the Pope, the so-called ad limina visit, he's, and, and, um, and John Paul II really liked Quaresino too, right? And he said, Holy Father, it's really good to talk to you. Hey, would you sign this? And, and so that's how it happened. It was because Quaresino but, but, and it was Francis' holiness, and it was the, um, uh, you know, these, the experience of these retreats that Quaresino saw Bergoglio giving his priest. So that, that was the immediate reason. Um, but I mean, um, John Paul II named him a cardinal in 2001, so John Paul II saw that in him, in him as well. I think you were next, sir. And then there's one over here? Okay. Thank you Sorry, for I your, gotta back up a little, I can't see everyone. Thank you for your presentation. To what extent do you think Pope Francis will 
make institutional changes that incorporates his change in style of leadership from mm -hmm. the authoritarian <clears throat> style that we've seen to a more collegial uh, decision-making process, and will that have some yeah. perhaps lasting impact on the papacy mm -hmm. itself? Okay, so I get out my crystal ball. Um, <clears throat> and this is being recorded, so you know in 10 years people can go back and say, boy, you really got that one wrong. Um, well, I mean, one of the things he's doing is, is, is by the cardinals that he appoints. I mean, he's now appointed at least a plurality of the cardinals who will vote in the next election. And, and a major important thing for him has been avoid, appointing cardinals who represent more clearly the global makeup of the Catholic Church. Um, which is people from the cardinals from the global south. Um, so that, that's one way he's doing it. Um, we, we won't know, although it's, the document's been leaked a little bit, but um, there'll be an official document that reorganizes the Vatican Curia that will probably come out at the end of June. And uh, at least some of the rumors say that there's going to be one sort of super department called the Department of Evangelization, and the uh, the congregation for the doctrine of the faith will be made subordinate to that. Now, that would be a pretty big move, um, but we'll have to wait and see. And I, I mean, frankly, you know, I wish he had someone who had more organizational skills to help him on that, um, because he's a great pastoral leader, but, but I think, you know, he needs a good chief of staff who's taken some courses in maybe a place like this. And uh, Because basically, the Curie is, is run on a model based on the royal courts, um, from the 14th, 15th, and 16th century. And so getting it to move ahead into the modern era, I think, will be a challenge. But, but certainly the way that the, the, the um, makeup of the Cardinal, of College, uh, Cardinal College of Cardinals is changing because of the people that he's appointed. And he's also appointed people who also don't want a sort of a centralized bureaucracy that doesn't know what's going on, say, in Congo, or in Argentina, coming up with a one-size-fits-all rule. So, so I think those kind of changes will be lasting in terms of whoever gets elected as the next pope. Whether the, the changes on the, in the Vatican Curia will be successful or not, eh, I'm, I'm not so sure there. We'll just have to wait and see. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'm actually an 09 grad from the theology school here. And oh. uh, I've actually, you know, had a really wonderful experience under Francis's leadership, reading his writings, his theology, and growing from it. It's been an amazing past few years. Um, my kind of struggle, if you will, is that I don't really know uh, it, what are his theological influences, if you will. Like, what, what, where does he look back to? What does he read? And where is he coming from? It seems, I mean, his approach is obviously not uh, unique in the history of the church, but where does he go to for influence, you think? So a phrase that Pope Francis likes to use a lot is um, the, what he calls the, the holy faithful people of God. And uh, even back when, his, when he was provincial um, and he, was, um, he gave a talk to all the Jesuits of Argentina and, and he said, well, what do I mean by that? And, and, he, and he actually did a little bit of a kind of a riff on part of the Vatican document, Lumen Gentium. And he said, you know, it, if you want to know what to believe, you should go to the magisterium, right? Because the magisterium has the job of defining that. But he said, if you want to know how to believe, you should go to the people. Um, and he gave an example. He said, if you want to know what to believe about Mary, you know, you should, you should look at theology and statements. But if you want to know how to believe in Mary, you should go to people at Lourdes, or you should go and actually see. And, and the influence of his upbringing in a very devout Catholic family. Um, and for him, that's the more important question. So part of the frustration, because, yeah, I'm a theologian too, and I'm always looking for footnotes. Um, and, and, and he has read a lot. He's read widely. Um, but, but for him, the more important question is not, what are the particular doctrines that we should believe, although he doesn't think those are unimportant. But he wants, to, for him, it's how do we believe them? How do we make them a part of our day-to-day -day lives and, you know, so that they bring about this sort of ongoing encounter with the mercy of Christ? And, and I think particularly as Pope, he sees himself as focused on that question. And, and that's the difference, right? And he's, he, he, uh, he didn't finish his doctorate, by the way. Uh, 
Um, so he's different from his two predecessors, who were both at one stage in their lives academics. I mean, he's a really smart guy, let's not, but he's not an academic, and so he's not gonna approach these kind of issues the way that John Paul II did or the way that Benedict did. Although there's a real beauty, you know, he has a very pastoral and you know, homiletical sort of style. So, um, so in other words, I just found a very elaborate way not to really answer your question, um, which is something they teach us to do in graduate school. Um, but <laughs> what I tried to do was say, though, that um, for him, that's not the most important thing. Um, and, and that's what really gets a lot of, like, you know, just recently, I think 19 or 20 Catholic theologians and philosophers signed a letter accusing him of being a heretic. Um, because they said, you won't get down there and say what the doctrines are. And, and he said in an interview, he said, well, if you want to know what the doctrines are, I'm a, I'm a son of the church, just go and read the magisterium. But that's not the most important question for him. And he just sort of refuses to get bogged down in it. Um, but that question of it's not what we believe, but how we believe, for him, that's what a pastor should be concerned with. And you remember in that little, the little joke that he made in the Mexican interview, he sees himself as a parish priest. And the job, well, I'm, I don't know, what, well, obviously I have an opinion on what the job of a parish priest is, but, you know, the, the really good pastors that I have known are the pastors who, they care most deeply about how people believe and how the doctrines of the church are sort of seeping into the warp and the woof of your life. And that's what he's concerned about, and that may be why it's, a, it's difficult to sort of get a handle on, you know, does he think liberation theologian is okay or not? You know, does he agree with Benedict the Sixteenth theology or not? And, and the reason why it's difficult to get a handle on that question is that that's not the most important thing in his mind. And he's worked a little hard to try and not get involved in those sorts of questions. So, yes, sir. Hi, thank you very much for doing this. Oh, sorry, oh, I'll, I'll get to you next. Go ahead. Uh, I think you started to just touch on this, but I'm, I'm interested in your um, impression or if you could educate us on what you think the impact is of these efforts to undermine the Francis, the impact on him, but also the impact on the papacy, particularly any efforts from this side of the Atlantic to challenge, to the, challenge uh, him. I'm sorry, the, uh, uh, the effect of his efforts to do what? The effect of the, the uh, efforts from others to undermine him. Oh, the critics, him. okay. Yeah, both on the political side and, and the theological side. Um, well, I mean, it's obviously painful, and I think it's painful to him. Um, but again, I think his view, and, and I do think that it is shaped to some extent by the experience that he had in the 70s of, um, you know, he's just going to let them say what they're going to say. He, you know, he's not that interested in and sort of shutting them down. And, and I think he wants to model in his own life the sort of openness to dialogue. Um, I mean, he's very much, um, he, he and, and again, I don't know if it's growing, well, he wasn't in a really big family, five kids isn't that big, but, but you know, in a big city, um, I mean, he's not afraid of the sort of back and forth of argument and division. And, and so I think he's just willing to sort of let that play out and, um, and, you know, if, if you, I mean, I don't know if a poll has been done. I mean, he has strong support, though, among the bishops and among the cardinals. And, and I think many of them are sort of aghast at this sort of, um, you know, this sort of effort, um, which... Oh, no, I mean, the European, I mean, some of the signatories of this letter are from England and Europe. I would say in Europe and, and England, although, you know, so I've, I've given this lecture in different places, right? And it's interesting to see what people get irritated with him about. But any administrator has that problem, right? So I went to Miami, and they, this was right after he had brokered the end of the um, embargo, right? And some of them, they're really angry there. I was in LA, in Orange County, and the Chinese Americans, they were really upset about this kind of deal that the Vatican is brokering about bishops. So. You know, I think he's been an, a leader, an administrator long enough to know that you're not going to please everybody. But, but I think, by and large, you know, those kind of criticisms, I think, though, are more, if I can use the phrase, sort of, they disagree with the policy decisions that he's made, if I can put it that way. I think the more fundamental sort of 
disagreements over <clears throat> these issues of doctrine and whether he's faithful to doctrine. That, I do think, is more of a North American and European sort of issue. And I, I just, I, I don't think long term it, it, it's going to play out. Yes. Pope Francis has had a, a tremendous amount of, of resistance um, among the curia, as well as the most conservative bishops around the world, for his efforts uh, to uh, reform and deal with the church's problem of pedophilia. Mm -hmm. There's been tremendous resistance for this, and it's been, uh, I think, puzzling for a lot of people in the church. Um, Frederick Martel recently wrote a book on the Vatican that uh, yeah. uh, he presented uh, a, a very clear-cut theory that was very well documented, but the book was also filled with a lot of gossip and hearsay. Um, I don't really know what to think about the book and its theory on Pope Francis's problems in the church. Could, could you shed any light on that? Well, I think, I mean, let, let's, let's be clear. I mean, Benedict XVI had already started the process of trying to get control. And, and I think um, <clears throat> at least one reason why he resigned was that he realized he just didn't have the energy to, to do what needed to be done. Um, I mean, let me say a couple of things. I, I think, you know, Pope Francis wanting to keep the focus outside. I mean, this is a really difficult challenge for him because it's turning our, assuming we're talking all Catholics together, it's turning our eyes back in on ourselves. And of course, and you know, in that little address that I gave, he says, we need to look out to a world. And, and so I think it's a really, really difficult challenge for him. Um, because he doesn't want to get everything all tied up in these sort of internal fights and forms. I mean, that's what he called this sort of theological narcissism. Um, so it's, it's a very difficult challenge for him. And the other thing about it is that, as I said before, he really thinks that um, more responsibility should be given to local, you know, local churches, right? Um, and which is one of the reasons why he was elected, because there were a lot of other cardinals and archbishops you know, of other parts of the world who were just tired of every decision being made from Rome. And so, so again, you know, this sort of idea that it's his responsibility then to make some kind of mandate from Rome that's going to fix everything for the whole world, it just goes fundamentally against the grain. And, <clears throat> and so what he's been trying to do is I think, first of all, he takes the long view. I think he just, he realizes, I mean, he'll say, I'm not gonna be around here this long. And I, I think he's a, enough of a realist to realize he's not gonna fix everything himself. Um, but part of the problem why the Curia has become this sort of closed hothouse the way it is, is because of this issue of everything being centralized there. Um, and so I, I still tend to think that he wants to take the long view of trying to move decisions out, right? So for example, some of you might remember when um, the US bishops wanted him to mandate a Roman investigation of McCarrick, right? Um, and he refused to, but, and I myself think is because he wanted to say, this is your problem. You guys need to figure out how to fix it instead of just expecting Rome to do it. Now, you know, there's back and forth on that. So. Is there a problem in the Vatican? No one, well, no one. That's a, many would agree, and I think many in the Vatican as well. Um, I think Francis' own approach to fixing it is keeping true to that kind of vision, is that he's not going to suddenly close down the church for five years and spend all the time focusing on the interior problems. He wants to look at issues of refugees. He wants to look at young people who are leaving the church in droves. Um, he wants to look at issues of, I mean, he wants the church to be focused on all those wounds. And, but I think he's trying to do it in such a way that gradually the, the kind of energy that feeds this hothouse within the curia will dissipate. And also that local churches, by which I mean, say, the church in the United States, the church in China, the church in, in South America, 
will realize that they've got to look at how this looks differently in their own situation. So it's, it, it's not a silver bullet. It's not going to fix things tomorrow. And, um, but I think he's trying to take the long view. And, and as I said, I, I think that this is his own way of how he's come to understand church leadership based on, on the story that I told before. But we may have to check in, and well, I won't be checking in in 25 years before we get to that. Yes, please, maybe one more, and then we'll, I know I've kept you. I'll hang around, by the way, if you want to come up and chat. This is kind of a follow-up to what you okay. were just speaking of. Um, I know earlier in the presentation, you spoke of how Francis, his priority is binding up the wounds and addressing the wounds. Um, I'm wondering, from your perspective, if you believe that he thinks that the sex abuse crisis that the church has been kind of, that's been inflamed over the past year or so, is as great of a wound as maybe the laity feel that it is. Because I was at the um, sex abuse panel yesterday, and you know they're speaking about how this is going to be the defining issue of his papacy, kind of whether he likes it or not. You know, I know no. he wants to speak of the poor and everything, but um, I'm wondering what your perspective is on yeah. that. I think he's learning. I, I don't think he got it. I mean, I think, and you know, particularly not just the United States. I mean, the the way that he originally dealt with this horrible catastrophe when it came up in Chile was just a disaster. But I mean, he realized it and he apologized, and then he took action, probably more dramatic action than he's taken on anything, you know, in um, <clears throat> accepting so many resignations of bishops. But no, I don't think. I I think he's still on a learning curve um, in trying to figure that out, uh, and. Yeah, so I, I guess I'll, and I do think to begin with, he didn't, he didn't get it. He didn't realize the, and, and, you know, for me, you know, there was the initial, you know, horror that I remember from 2002 and 2003, and then again last, you know, a year ago now, and, you know, it, it's a wound that isn't going away, and I think he's only slowly beginning to see how, how deep that is. Okay, thank you all very much, it's been fun.